Right. So we start by looking at how many arrangements, uh, for instance, of the letters A, B, C, D, um, leave none of the letters A, B, or C in their original positions. Okay. This question is seven marks. Expect to see this question um, on the day of the exam. Um, I think it's after tomorrow. So how do we answer this question? How many arrangements of the letters um, in A, B, C, D? So A, B, C, D is actually a sequence. And it is a sequence of four letters. And now we're seeing how many arrangement, uh, arrangements of the letters in A, B, C, D leave a none of the letters A, B, or C in their original positions. What is the examiner looking for here? He's looking for the number of arrangements. So in other words, we need to form arrangements of the letters A, B, C, D. Right. So let's get started to, to determine the number of the arrangements. How do we do this? So there is some restriction here that um, the letters in that leave none of the letters in their original positions. And so we let N. Let N be the number Right, be the number of arrangements. Right, so we let n be the number of arrangements. Of the letters. Right, of the letters in A, B, C, D, this given sequence. Then, what is n the number of the arrangements? If one gives the letters A, B, C, D, what is then the number of the arrangements? Okay, so the number of the arrangements in this case would be, there are how many letters here? There are exactly uh, four letters. So to get the total number of the arrangements, we first choose, we need to arrange these ones, the four letters. So we need to choose one first to arrange them. After we have chosen one, one, two, three, four. After we, we, we choose uh, the letters here. So the first letter can be chosen in four ways. After the letter has been chosen in four ways, maybe it's A that has been chosen. The next one can be chosen in three ways. Perhaps it's D that has been chosen. They don't need to be in order. The next one is chosen in, a, in, in two ways. If uh, it's chosen, then we have one. So in other words, you have four, three, two, one. Four factorial ways. So in other words, the number of the arrangements uh, then is four factorial. So they can be arranged in four factorial ways because these letters themselves are different. These therefore are different from the sequences we saw last time, which were the um, ternary sequences and the binary sequences that consist of zeros, ones, uh, twos, and so on. Right, so now what we do is uh, we let we let A be the be the set of arrangements. In a set of arrangements of A, B, C, D, such that A is actually in position, is in position, in position one. Okay, so we always do this like we did last time, but let's look at how we handle this problem here. We let A be the set of arrangements of A, B, C, D such that A is in position one. Remember that um, we're looking at the arrangements of the letters um, in A, B, C, D, um, right? Leave, such that we leave none of the letters in their original positions. So if we let A be 
the set of arrangements of A, B, C, D, such that A is in position one. Okay, that's A. We have another set B, which is the set of such arrangements, set of such arrangements with B in position in position two. Okay. So in other words, we have A in position one, that is the set A. And there is the set B of arrangements, right? Arrangements with B in position two. Right, so we continue. We must have up to D because there are four letters here. So we have C now. There's another set C. Uh, right, so C is the set with the C in position. Right, the C is in position three. Like you can see in the original um, examiner's sequence of the letters. Okay, so we continue. We just have the um, the ordering um, of the letters. Right, so right, C is in position three and D. The set with right, the set with B in position in position four. Then Right, so in other words, so we have D in position four. We are saying now the arrangements of these such that A is in position one. That we don't care about the rest of the of the letters in their positions in the sequences. But now we are saying A is in position one and we can mingle the others in any order. All right. And 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 the D now is in position four, and we don't care about the order, the, the, the ones at the beginning, the three in the three first three positions of each of the um, sequences. Okay, what is the meaning of this? And what is the implication? The implication then is the number of the arrangements in the set A will therefore be the same as the number of the arrangements in set B and will be the name will be the same as the number of the arrangements in set C and will be the same as the number of the arrangements in set D. Okay. And uh, now we're asking the question if we are to say in position one, there is A. So we like in set A, but just the forming sequences are that all that only start with A, and then we don't care about the rest, right? But obviously, we understand that the, um, the rest of these must be actually um, sequences of length four. Now, the ordering here will be in one way we can put A and then the, the rest here can be put uh, because there are three of them. We can, the first one here, we can choose in three ways. After that one has been chosen, the next one can be chosen in two ways. After that has been chosen, we have one letter B left and it can be chosen in one way. So in other words, these arrangements are arrangements um, um, can, that can be performed in three factorial ways. And therefore, we then say the number of the arrangements in the A, B, C, or D, where we're just fixing one letter and organizing the three, because we fix A and then we organize the three, uh, the number of the sequences become uh, three factorial there. Okay, next. What do we do to get the, all these arrangements? We therefore can um, uh, obtain an, the intersection of the sets A and B, A starts with A, all the sequences start with A in the, in the set A, and then the arrangements in B start with, uh, um, contain the letter B in position two, all right? Okay, we look at the intersection of this. Why do we look at the intersection? Why? 
<laughs> we look at the intersection because uh, these kinds of problems where you have uh, restrictions uh, always uh, entail something we call the inclusion. Uh, hello? Yes, please. Uh, can you explain uh, one more time how you got the three factorial? Okay, the three factorial. Right. Okay, good. We need to remember that let's look at the set A and the conditions under which it's stated. Right. So we let A be the set of arrangements of A, B, C, D because the examiner gave us the sequence um, of letters A, B, C, D. Right. And so we then say, um, and we always do, if we want to find arrangements of three letters, four letters, we fix positions. So let A be the set of arrangements of A, B, C, D. Okay, we arrange these ones uh, in a set A and we put the arrangements in the set A. But what do we say about the arrangements? My goodness. Okay, such that A is in position one. Okay, so if A is in position one, we already know that A is in position one. So that can be done in one way because if we are to pick the letter A from here, we just pick the A. It's, it's in one way. We don't have to say, do we either choose A or B or C or D, which could be four ways to do that. But if we are to choose A, um, we choose A in one way. Okay, in one way. After A has been chosen, we remove it from the sequence. Then we're left with three letters to choose from because we need to form arrangements of this. Um, and we need to exhaust all the letters. The letter that we need to put here to form an arrangement of four symbols, um, we can either choose B to put here, or we can choose C, or we can choose D. So we can choose from three letters, and this can be done in, in, in a total of what three ways, because we have three choices to make. So we have three ways there. Okay, suppose if we need to choose, we can choose D. Doesn't matter which one, because we need to choose from the three. A is already selected. Um, after D has been chosen, we're left with two letters to choose from. And therefore, we can choose either B or, or, or C. So we have we can do that in two ways. Okay, suppose we choose B. And then we're left with C. And then after we're left with C, then now the C can be chosen in only one way because it's only one, uh, one uh, letter. So the number of ways, it's one times three times two times one. Total number of ways. This one is becomes the total number, total number of arrangements. Total number of the arrangements in the set A. So the total number of the arrangements will be one times uh, three times two times one. Okay, so we can say it is three factorial ways. Because the one, three factorial is three times two times one. We can put the one, but yeah, doesn't make a difference at all. Okay, so we have that. Next, now, because we go, when we have questions like this, uh, we use the inclusion exclusion principle to simplify the total counting uh, uh, problem. So we need to consider intersections so that when we use the formula, we are at ease. Okay, so we need to consider now A intersection B. And let's consider all possible intersections. A intersection B, B intersection C, and so on. Okay, let's look at A intersection B. What is A intersection B? So this one is the set. Is the set of arrangements. Right, so this one becomes the set of arrangements with A in position one. It has A in position one and B in position two. Okay, because we saw that A is a set of arrangements with A in position one, because A, the sequence the arrangements in A had A in position one and, uh, and the arrangements in B had B in position two. Okay, that is how we defined the two sets. So we need to define we proceed to define certain intersections, like A intersection C. We look at possible intersections because there are uh, lots of sets here. There are four sets in particular. This is quite a complex problem. 
Um, right. So we have A intersection C. We have A intersection D. Because the inclusion ex exclusion requires all of them. And then you have B intersection C. We have B intersection D. And we have C intersection D. Analogously. Okay. Analogously. Now, because we first in the um in the inclusion exclusion, we need to actually look at the possibilities when the possible arrangements when um we have a sequence sequences that begin with a with a with b with that if a in the first position b in the second and so on so we're looking at uh, possibilities in each of the positions okay what would be this mean now then then we can be able to find the number of the sequences like the number of the sequences in a and b Right, um, must be the same as those in A and D, the same as the number of the sequences, the number of the arrangements in B and C, the number of the arrangements in what? In B and D, the same as the number of the arrangements in C and D, okay? And uh, now the question is how many of these? Okay, right. So obviously at this point, if we intersect the two sets, the set A has A in position one. B, The set B has B in position two. So it means therefore the position one and position two have been, have been are fixed here. So we can only play around with the um, the other positions because we have we have A, B, C, and D as the total number of the letters, but we can um, if we are to say we are finding the intersection of A and B, okay, A fixes the first position, B set B fixes the, the second position with, with B, so we are actually now have the C and D letters to play with, so we have uh, uh, two factorial ways because uh, now we can we have two as two letter sequences to deal with, um, right? Obviously there are four letter sequences. This, but the position the, the first uh, positions we already have the A and the B in the A intersection uh, B, and then now we have the C and D, right? If you have the C and D, the A and the B can be chosen in one one way because they are fixed already according to the way we assumed the sets. But this one here is two one, so we have this. Okay, we're done, we're done. Okay, next question. We continue now, um, because the inclusion exclusion requires us to look at the individual sets, the intersection of a pair of the sets, all pairs, all possible pairs, and then, we have now the intersections of the three sets because we're looking at pairs now, the triples. So A intersection, B intersection, C is the set. Right, is the set of arrangements. Is the set of arrangements with with A in position one. Okay, so now if we're looking at the, because the inclusion exclusion, once again, principle requires us to look at all these, but you're going to see the formula for the, um, for four sets. Okay, because now we did, the formula we used last time was for, for three sets. Right, so um, quite a, an advanced question this. So we have the A, B, and C is a set of um, arrangements with A in position one. Um, right and B in position two. Right, B in position two. C. 
in position three. All right. <laughs> These pin actually spreads the ink there. Okay. Right. So we have seen position three. Right. You have C in position. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is nothing new. The fact that A is in position one, the set A, B is in position two. Um, in the set B and C, in the position three, in the set uh, C. It's it's how we actually defined um, the set at the beginning. But now, what is very important is we therefore proceed to define. We proceed to define A intersection B intersection D. A intersection C intersection D. Okay, we're looking we're looking we're looking at many of them. And um B intersection C intersection D analogously. Okay, so in other words, given the four sets A, B, C, and D, how many triples can we form? Either we intersect um we either we intersect the A, B, and C, or we intersect A, B, D, or we intersect um, A, C, D, or we intersect uh, B, C, D. Okay. Right. Yeah, these are the possible triples that we can form analogously. Okay. Right, right, right. Um, um, analogously. Okay, we think about this. Okay, then the next thing is, is to count the number of the elements. Um, so then we ask in the question how many um, uh, arrangements are there in each of these sets were formed? Okay, because we're just interested in the number of the arrangements in each of the sets. Um, the sets are just... Uh, good for us because they contain the things so we okay so um right so then you have the n which is the a intersection b Intersection C, which is this one, then we 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 find in we count the numbers here, but obviously here we fix everything. This one fixes A. This one fixes um, the second position with B. This one fixes the third position. So we fix the A. We fix B. We fix C. We can only arrange D alone. So the letter D alone, for instance, in the A B C arrangement. Okay, in this one here, we can arrange what? Because we fix uh, the first position, the, the third position, the fourth position, and we can only arrange uh, B, uh, right? So we are forming four letter sequences here. But in the end, this one, it's the number of the uh, arrangements in the uh, A, B, C, number of the arrangements in the next one, A, B, D, Number of the arrangements in A, C, D. Number of the arrangements in B, C, D. So there's only one. Okay, because in B, C, D, we fix b, 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 the second position, the third and the fourth. So you can only arrange the first. Next one, finally. Right, so finally, finally, we are actually supposed to consider A intersection B, intersection C, intersection D. Right, so now we are intersecting all four. We intersected with the first, the pairs, triples, and now we're looking at, at quadruples. 
Right, so these quadruples here, we need to form all possible quadruples, but obviously we agree that we can only form a single um, quadruple there because we only have four letters. Uh, then we can just switch the positions. But yeah, because there are four, we can only intersect the four sets. But finally then, this is the set. Is the set of arrangements. Is the set of arrangements with all the letters. In the original in the original positions. All right, so and so what does that mean? Well, it means if you had to look at these, how many sequences are in this set where we intersect all the sets? Right, so we count the number of the sequences to so the number of the sequences in the A intersection, B intersection, C intersection, D. It's exactly one. Okay, so as a consequence then, now by the By the inclusion, exclusion, principle, we have that. We have that A intersection. Um, the complement of A intersection, the complement of B intersection, the complement of C um, intersection, the complement of D. Okay. Is the um, number of all the possible arrangements minus the the first um, the single element sets or the single uh, sets like the A, the B, and the C plus the ordered pairs minus the triples. And uh, plus the quads, the quadruples. We remember that the A, B, C, D, different letters could only be arranged in four factorial ways. Okay, now here, because we're dealing with the um, single um, sets, A, B, C, and D, and there are four of them. Right, so in these um, inclusion exclusion principle, what do we do? We use the combination. So each of the sets can actually be be chosen in in a from four sets. You choose one at a time to count, but you counted three factorial for each of the sets. Let's look at the pairs of the sets. The pairs of the sets. So we have four. Um, we have four. Um. We formed four of the pairs. Okay, because we come here, how many did we form? Um, right, so how many did we actually form there? Right, so obviously we agree that we actually have one, two, three, four. Right, and after that, we had one, two, three, four, five of the pairs, right. And so we actually therefore agree that from the four, one, two, three, four, we actually chose pairs 
from the four sets, we formed pairs. Right. So in other words, from the four sets, we chose a pair. And we got that each one of them was um, two, um, two factorial. Uh, the number of the arrangements in each of the uh, intersections of the pairs, um, the, the arrangements were actually, number of the arrangements actually was two factorial. Next, from the, from the four sets, we chose three to form the triples. So it was four choose three. But in the four choose three case, the triples get only one. The triples get only one. Get only one. Okay, so we have four is four. Okay, um, out of the four, we chose four to form these, these ones, the four, the four intersections. But we realize that obviously, if you fix, this one fixes the first position, the, the second, the third, and the fourth. So you had all the positions fixed. So in the end, um, in how many ways could this, how many um, arrangements could be there? It was actually just only one arrangement. Why one arrangement? Because um, as we said, if you fix, it means that you have one choice. The first position must be filled with A. The second position of the sequence, what positions are we talking about here? Well, speaking about these sequences here, so you can put blanks for each of these. So here we put A, here we put B, and there we put C, we put uh, we put C, then we put what? We put B. Okay, here my, there must be A, so it's one way, one way, one way, one way. You understand? So therefore it's one way. Like that. So this one is four factorial. Okay, this one, four choose one. Can you even use a calculator? It's four times three factorial. Four choose two, it's six times two factorial. Oh, okay. This one is four choose three. Four choose three. Is four times one factorial. Four choose four is one. So this one, four factorial is it is twenty four. This one is twenty four. This one is 12. This one is 4 plus 1. Hey, okay. if you add everything, you get 9. So the number of the arrangements um, is actually 9 there. So um, a good uh, and interesting problem where we are going to, we are actually looking at four letter sequences. Remember, we look at three letter sequences. The, the tenaries, you know, zero, one, two, uh, three letters. But now this one is just um, one question. So um, this is the complement of D. So now at this point, because the question was, how many arrangements of the letters A, B, C, D leave none of the letters e, uh, A, B, or C in their original positions? Okay, so none of these could be left in the original positions. And therefore, um, we could have possible arrangements there. Okay. We could have possible arrangements there. And as we discussed, 
the possible arrangements are only nine of them. Okay, next question. Right, um, we have these. Okay. Now there's something I wanted to look at here, and uh, this is about the um, certain arrangements that are good. Okay, this is uh, the in the exam, please. How do we deal with this? Kind of a question. How do you find the number of integer solutions in um, integer solutions to the inequality? This how? Okay, so we continue. You continue. Under the constraints that the sum of x plus y plus z is at most 25, is 25 or less, is this equal to 25? Under the constraints that um, x, y, and z respectively are greater or equal to 5. Right, so at this point, we're saying inequality. An inequality like this one, for instance, how do we solve it? Right, an inequality like these can always be converted. Okay, we always do this conversion. You watch how we solve this inequality. So we do a conversion. How do we do the conversion? Um, right, it can always be converted. Into an equation. Into an equation by introducing An extra variable. An extra variable. What kind of a variable do we introduce? We introduce the variable t, such that we then say t is the same as. T becomes the same as 25. Right, take this 25 and then you transpose all these terms to the other side. So which means therefore we have uh, 25, right, we have 25 uh, minus X minus Y minus Z. Thus we have. Thus, we have that x plus y plus z is 25. Okay, we take this 25 and we move everything so that 25 minus these things is greater or equal to 0. And then we put a t there in the place of the 0. So that you have sort of t equals this. Thus we have that the x plus y plus z, because it is less or equal to this, so the equalizer here is the variable t. So if we drop in the t here, this was less, so it becomes equal. But understand that this t here has some positivity. But also the x, y, and z themselves are strictly positive because they are five for more than five. So five is a positive number. Okay, so we we have that. So this makes sense, this equation. What is the t actually? We say more about the variable t that we introduced. 
where t is the is also an integer and uh, it follows from the given from the given inequality right where t is actually also an integer it uh, and it follows from the given inequality that t greater or equal to 0 The, thus, the constraints to this equation are, what are the constraints? So the constraints are x, y, z, Greater or equal to five. Why? Because they're given uh, the these constraints. Um, now also the t is also an integer, but the condition on it is that t is greater or equal to zero. Right. Moreover, we can. Right. We can model. Right. We can actually model. Right, so we can model this problem as follows. We model these beautifully, but you look at how we what are we what are we doing here? We are finding the number of integer solutions to these to say how many integers here actually satisfy these. Okay, so somebody can come and say, okay, um, how many integers could this be such that x, y, and z are greater or equal to five? Okay x, y, and z are greater equal to 5. What other integers are there? You can put 5 and 5 here, for instance. If you put 5, 5, 5 plus 5 is what? It's actually 10. But what can the next one be? So that these are. Okay, if it's 10, you can realize that z can possibly be like a 15, for instance. So if you have 25, 25 is less equal to 25, in which case the, the inequality is true. But also, you can, you can put, if you put 5, 5, 5, then you have less. Okay, so all these, now the, if they are five, then you also have uh, the, the triple of, of fives. Okay, um, so, but the question, we can't count because now in the exam, you need to know how many uh, by using the methods we use that saying, okay, um, I can think of the integers if their X and Y can be five, then you can put all fives. Or um, if you put 10, 10, and then we have 20, and then this one here can be 5, which is 25, that kind of thing. So, I mean, it can also be done by trial and error, but this is how we do it in this module. By looking at integer solutions, the values of x and y and z greater or equal to 5 that make this true, we can model this situation. We can model this situation as placing Placing identical, identical objects, good. This is the analogy we use. Is placing identical objects. For well, this becomes like placing identical objects into, into four distinct containers. Four distinct containers. With at least at least five objects. Okay. We shall understand what this means and how we we actually count the number of integer solutions to these because this is an inequality. It has some solutions. Mm 
with at least five objects. We can model this situation as placing identical objects into four distinct what containers. Okay. With at least five objects in each. Right. With at least five objects in each of the of the first uh, three containers. So what do we do? We actually first place, because you need to understand the method, first place five objects. Five objects into each, into each of the first three containers. Right. Then we proceed as follows. Okay, let's look at these. So uh, we can model the situation as placing identical objects into four distinct containers. Right, why four distinct containers? Because obviously we have four letters here. Um, right, with at least five objects. Um, right, in each of the first three containers. Right, so because we have at least five objects um, in each of the first three containers, we have X, Y, and Z as containers, but at least five, uh, at least five. So at least five objects in each of them because X can have at least five objects, uh, at least five, at least five there with the Z. So first place five objects into each of the first three containers. Then, Then, then we have 25 minus, 25 minus 5 times 3, because we can put 5 objects in the first 3 containers, in the, in, in, in the first container, second container, and the, and, and the third container, we can put um, at least 5 objects, and there are 3 of those. So in other words, from a total of uh, 25, we subtract we subtract um five times three because there are three containers with at least five objects in um in each okay right so and therefore this is the same as what is actually 25 minus five by three which is 15 and the result is 10 objects is 10 objects you have to be placed still have to be placed this gives so in other words then we have that 10 objects still have to be what still have to be placed because we have placed the objects in X, Y, and Z. We're talking about X, Y, and Z uh, there. But obviously we have 10 objects still have to be placed. Now we continue with the analysis of this question. This gives, what does this actually give us? This gives, now we come to this particular um, 
a situation. So this gives 10. 10 objects still have to be placed. Plus 4 minus 1. Choose 10. So we must choose 10. Um, right, so we remember this. It's R plus N, choose R minus 1. This formula. Okay, so this is a very interesting formula because it uh, relates to a couple of things, but it also relates to um, counting types. We spoke about counting types, so we will just obviously revisit that number of types of, 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 of given identical objects and things. Right, so. But this therefore gives that if you use this formula here, where you have 10 objects still have to be placed. So now, in other words, you need Hello? to choose. Yes, please. Uh, how did you get four? How did we get four? Well, because we have a total of four um, variables here. One, two, three, four. We introduced T with initially three, but we ultimately have four um, objects. That is why we're then saying we shall model this situation as placing identical objects into four distinct containers. What are the four distinct containers? They are the X, Y, Z, and T. Okay, now, um, then we continue and we say, Right, 10 plus 4 is uh, is 14 minus 113. 10. Like this. We're done. We're done. So, um, how many integer solutions are there? There are 13 choose 10. So this is what we do. So, okay, we look at this very carefully and try to, th because this is how we, we solve a, a problem like this. And these problems are examinable. They are worth a lot of marks. The next one is like, it's, it's, it's even worth more marks because um, it has a bit more restrictions. Uh, there, let's look at the next question. Right, here comes the next question. If one says we have solved that one, that had X, Y, and Z. Now this one has a total of four letters, A, B, C, and D. And so with A, B, C, and D, we asking the question, how do we solve this one here? So in other words, how do we even proceed to find they are known things and to arrive at the answer to this question we think but we think very very carefully okay so we ponder on this one find the number of integer solutions to that this will ordinarily be quite a complex question but I must indicate that this is the kind of question you really will expect to find in the exam that is coming. So it's very important to familiarize ourselves with this. What becomes the answer to this one? Right, so we shall think about it together. In fact, we shall work um, on these together. We're going to solve this one together and see how it's solved. But how is this one different from that one? But now here you can see that they were saying the A, X, Y, and Z were at least five, so greater or equal to five. But here we are saying C and D are greater or equal to eight. But the A and B are greater than five. And so um, we have this kind of a problem in front of us. 
And we think very carefully of how to begin by uh, solving these. Right, so let's get let's get cracking. Right, so to, to start solving this particular problem, we need to think and think extra, extra carefully. Um, what are the restrictions on the letters? In the way we started last time? Right, in the way we started last time. Okay, here's the answer. And this is how we do it. We notice the pattern of reasoning here in view of the, but yeah, it's the same thing, but it's just that now we just have two different restrictions. In the first case, only the variables were at least five, but here they're at least eight. This one's greater than five, greater than five. How do we proceed? This is how we do it. Right, an inequality um, like this, Want to find the, how many integer solutions are there? Let's satisfy this. <clears throat> All right, so um, an inequality. Like this. And always. be converted, we can always convert, like we started last time, we always convert these and we put a T there and we shall do that. So it can always be converted into an equation. So first we, we make it, we make these inequalities uh, equations into uh, an equation. By introducing, Right, by introducing an extra variable. Right, we always introduce an extra variable. How do we introduce the variable? Okay, if it's less than or equal to like most of the problems are stated, because normally we go for less than or equal to because now if it could be greater it could go to infinity, potentially. Okay, so we have a finite number because it's less. And now we have positivity of this, etc. in which case we have a finite number, it, it becomes possible to count, right? And with that, so we have, we use a, a similar pattern of reasoning. So we take the T and then we transpose everything to the other side. So we would have therefore 50 minus A, minus B minus C minus D. Thus, we have. Thus, we have that. Right. Thus, we have that. All right. We have that. We can add these things like um, the A, the B, the C, the D. Then we add T. So because it was less, if we drop in the T, then the T is so much of an equalizer, making the less than and equal to. We moreover go proceed to state where T is also an integer. An integer in the, it follows. from the given inequality. It follows from the given inequality that P is greater or equal to zero. Okay, because obviously if you move everything to the other side like this, um, you realize that, um, but also just from the fact that 
you dropped in the T here, this was less, and it has made this equal. So the T must be a positive um, number or non-negative. To, to, to sort of, this was less, and it has pushed it up in magnitude, increased it in magnitude to sort of equal the 50. So uh, the T we understand must be uh, greater or equal to zero. Okay, we continue. We continue. Right, so we always reason like this, like we did in the previous uh, question, but yeah, this one is uh, has uh, having two different constraints, five and eight. So yeah, that's why we need to do it. Thus the constraints, thus the constraints to this equation. Are what are the constraints to this equation? So the constraints to this equation are a. Well, because a is greater than five, we can make it because we are looking at the integers uh, associated with it. So we can start from six. It's strictly greater than five, but it can't be five. So the next integer that a can be. It's six can be seven is strictly greater than five. So we can say um, A is at least six or it's six or more, all right. And the same applies to the B. The B is six or more. The C is uh, this one is already having equality. Uh, this is, has an equality, and that is an equality. The D also has an equality. The P is greater or equal to zero. Okay, so we have these with equalities now. Now, with the equalities, because the trick was, what was, what was the trick here? These were strict inequalities. A, A was strictly greater than five. But now we will need to work with equalities, with greater or equal to, not just strictly greater, because we need to know that we're starting from six. And in fact, we're not starting from five. And that was the small trick in this question. Right, we proceed to state the usual rhetoric. We can model, we proceed with the model. So we can model this situation. Right, we can model this situation as placing. So we speak about containers, always we do that. As placing 50, identical. objects into five distinct containers. with at least six objects in each. Okay, we use uh, those words like we saw before. I'm writing the story here, but you can follow where the numbers are coming from. Uh, right, six objects in each um, of the first. In each of the first two containers, and at least and at least eight objects
um, in the at least eight objects into each into each of the third of the third and fourth containers. Okay, now we will just follow the numbers here. Third and fourth containers. Okay. Then, okay, we shall analyze this together. So we proceed with the model. We can model this situation like stated there. And uh, we have exactly that. Okay, so we continue. Okay, we'll continue. Okay, we we'll continue. Okay, I was saying that we can we can model this situation as placing 50. Okay, look at how we use the word 50 there. It's placing 50 identical objects into five distinct containers. Where is five coming from? Well, because we have five letters here, so each one is like a container because it, it's a placeholder, we can put some integers that can sum to 50. So we can put an integer, an integer, an integer, so that they sum to 50. Like if it's, yeah, okay. But it depends on the, now the restrictions. The A can start from six, the B six, start from six, etc. You can get those combinations. Uh, yes, please. Uh, how did you get six? Okay, we got six from five. Because the question says A is greater than five. But if we're looking at integers, if somebody says this integer A is, is, is strictly bigger than five, uh, if we're to plot that on the number line, we can say, um, we put five here on the number line. Right, so we put five there. Okay, we put five here. If you put five there on the number line, so this becomes, for instance, a number line greater than five, you do this. Okay. So greater than five, you do this, then what integers are actually included? So instead of saying that because it means A is not five, but it's strictly bigger than five. In terms of integers, it means that we are starting from six. Okay, because we're speaking about the, the next integer, the next integer after five that is bigger than five, that this inequality includes, it can be equal to six. So A can be equal to six, but A can't be five because it's strictly bigger than five. So we need to start from six or more. Right, we can't say if strictly bigger than five, we can't start from 5.5 .5 because it's just integers. So we just focus on the counting. Next. Um, right, so we can model the situation as placing 50 identical objects into five distinct containers. We have one container, one, two, three, four, five. So we have five containers. And we can um, we can model the situation as placing fifty identical objects into so we're placing the objects into um, fifty identical objects into uh, five different containers, right? With at least six objects in each of the first two containers. The first two containers um, here, A and B, start from six. So we actually have at least six, at least six, six or more in the first two containers in the A and B. In, the, in, in I mean, each of the first two containers, and at least eight uh, objects in each of the third and the fourth, because this the third, C, and D, are at least eight. So we have at least eight objects in 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 C and D. Okay. Right. Very interesting problems. These. Okay. They're just counting methods, but we have combinatorics and counting to to model this. Okay, it's, obviously we had not discussed these questions, it's our first time to discuss this, but yeah, this is a very holistic problem we're doing here. 
Um, after this, then we have we would have done two problems on finding the number of integer solutions, and these questions come in the exam. Um, right, so let's continue and solve these. First place. First place, six objects. In each of the first two. Right, so first place Okay. We continue here. First place six objects in each of the first two containers. Okay. First two containers and Eight objects. Eight objects into each. Of the third. And fourth. Containers. Okay, so we agree that in the third and the fourth, we put a, at least eight. Eight objects. Okay, first place six. First, first things first. First, because it's equal to six or more. First, we place six, six in the first two, A and B. We place six, and then in the C and D, we place first eight, and then but greater than eight. So, yeah. Then, what is the meaning of this here? Then, right? Then we have 50 because we said that. Um, this we can model this situation as placing 50 identical objects into the five distinct containers. So then 50 minus at least six in the first two containers, at least eight in the other two containers, C and D. And therefore this is 50 minus 28 is equal to what? 22 objects. You have to be placed. Have to be placed. These gives This gives, so what does it give? Like we said that it gives us the R plus N minus one choose R. So it actually gives us um, the 22 objects. So if 22, we choose 22 plus how many? Those, there are five because it's A, B, C, a, B, C, D, P. E. Two, four, five. Okay, so we have five and then minus one. And so what is this here? It's 27 minus one, which is 26, 22. And this is, that's 26, 22. 
So that is the number of ways to do this. Um, right, so and 26, 22, by symmetry becomes the same as 26 choose 4. 26 choose 4. Right, so that kind of thing. How do we know this? Because, I mean, there are a couple of examples where these binomial coefficients become the same. Like, um, 4 choose 0 is the same as 4 choose 4. Because this one is 1, that one is 1. 4 choose 2 you can compare it with 4 choose 3. Uh, hello? Yes, please. I'm confused. That... Yeah, it the how these four... two are equal. Right, you can test these because now you can test this one and say, uh, because the observation follows from the numbers. Because n choose r is the same as in factorial, but it's not necessary this, okay? But it's just a demonstration of the knowledge of numbers. All right, if you have n choose r, what is n choose r, the, the binomial coefficient? So it is um, n r factorial, n minus r factorial. So let's come to this one and use this formula. So this one is gonna be 26 factorial, 22 factorial, 26 minus 22 factorial, okay? So what is this? This is exactly 26 factorial divided by 22 factorial. What is 26 minus 22? 4 factorial. Right. So this is 26 factorial. 4 factorial. 26 minus 4 factorial. And this is 26 factorial. You divide by 4 factorial. What is 26 minus 4? 22 factorial. You can see that these are the same. But it's not necessary to write the four. <laughs> but it's just that they are the same because the denominator, the top is 26, 26. The bottom is 22 factorial, 4 factorial, 22 factorial, 4 factorial. So the tops and the bottoms are, are the same. That is why these would be that. But how significant is it? It's not necessary. Except that the number four is small enough, it's small enough to handle. It reduced the number 22 to a, to a smaller number. Okay, that kind of thing. But you can just stop at 26, choose 22. Okay. Have we answered this question and are we done with solving this problem? Yes, we are done with solving this problem. Because this problem actually said, find the number of integer solutions to this. How many integer solutions are there? There are 22, 26, choose 22. Or you can say there are 26, choose 4. That's what you get. 26, choose 4. Or you can say 26, choose 22. All right. And so we continue. We continue. Next question. Okay, I plan to that we play around with some of these recurrence relations because now they are in the exam, but this one is a is called the homogeneous recurrence relation. So this homogeneous recurrence relation is quite an easy one to deal with because it is called, uh, so this one, this one, we need to solve the recurrence relation. Normally these ones come in the exam under the long questions that will appear. So this one, I mean, after some experience, because there'll be long questions and there'll be multiple choice. So this is a linear. Right, so this is a linear homogeneous. homogeneous recurrence relation. Okay, we looked at an example like this on the recurrence relations. 
um, not exactly like this, but that has A, A, A with those subscripts like A subscript N, A, N minus 1, N minus 2. The characteristic equation The characteristic equation is what is so I will say is obtained is obtained as follows. Right, like we said last time, so I'm gonna use the same method so that we have consistent reasoning. Right, so what method do we use here? Is obtained the characteristic is something called the characteristic equation, and is the characteristic equation is obtained as follows. So we need to let a n. We let a n be alpha to the power. The alpha to the power n. So that. Right. So that we get what? We always do this. Okay, this one is the homogeneous type. So it's pretty straightforward to deal with this. But now you can have other cases as well. Um, Inhomogeneous is the next example, because if we look at the homogeneous and the inhomogeneous, then we can be able to solve all recurrence relations that exist. Okay, but now the, yeah, let's discuss the particular solutions of the next one. Okay, let this one be that. Then, then you would have, for instance, a n minus one, which equals this one, so well, this one, and then, there is a n minus two, which is alpha for this one. Uh, thus, right, let this, then that, so that. that. So that, right, then we substitute everything and then we're able to convert this one into an equation we can solve. Um, we, we can convert it to some quadratic, etc. equation, and then we can be able to factorize. Um, so that is the power of these. Let that be the case, then that is the case. So that. Right, so that we get alpha to the power n, 3 alpha to the power n minus 1, plus 40 alpha to the n minus 2. So now you can simplify this one. How do you simplify this one? You can get rid of the negative powers. You can multiply the negative minus two is sort of what is subtracting there. Um, it's sort of the least, whatever, um, or the biggest. Yeah, the least. Right. So you multiply by uh, the biggest, uh, al the alpha squared. Each of the terms. I don't care how you do it, but yeah, this is just one way. Can I write it from the margin? Okay, um, of the uh, screen. Let I create a bit more space. So that, for instance, if you have alpha to the power n. No, I don't want to say this. I want to write this in two steps. Okay, I want to first uh, write this equation. Okay, so first we copy this equation as it is. What is the equation? It is exactly a sub n equals to three um, a sub n minus one plus 40 a that. Right, and then we said that this one, you can replace it by that, the a sub n minus one, you can replace by alpha to the superscript, alpha to the superscript um, a, n minus two. We want to remove the negative indices, so we can multiply by alpha squared, 
just using algebra here. And then we have alpha squared into three alpha to the n minus one. And then we have alpha squared four t, you have alpha to the n minus two, alpha to the n plus two, three alpha to the n plus one, 40 alpha to the n. Okay, you divide by alpha to the n. Um, or you factorize. So alpha to the n plus two minus three alpha to the n plus one minus 40 alpha to the n equals zero, which means you have alpha to the n. This is alpha squared minus three alpha minus 40 equals zero. So which means that here we shall have either this one is zero or, um, okay, because we have a product of two things, uh, two entities uh, that is zero. So either that one is zero or alpha squared minus three alpha minus 40 equals zero. Okay, so we have this. or this. What is alpha squared? Alpha, alpha. Okay, now we need to factorize this. Um, okay, what are the factors of 40? Right, so um, there are factors of 40 that do this, so is alpha minus eight. And then, plus five, which is eight or alpha minus five. Therefore, alpha equals eight, and alpha equals minus five. The general solution. All right, is something called the general solution of the homogeneous recurrence relation. The general solution is right. The general solution is therefore a n which equals a, which is a to the power n plus b minus five to the power n. Okay, so. That becomes general solution. So we just raise this one to the power n and the other alpha to the power n. Then we use the initial conditions um, to solve this. Hence, we have that a n is a, this one to the power n plus b minus five to the power n from the initial conditions. From the initial conditions. We find that we find from the initial conditions we're able to get the numerical values of what? Um, um, of, uh, of A and B, because we just need to get A and B from the initial conditions, um, which were given to us. So from initial conditions, we find A and B. What are the initial conditions? Okay. The A zero is one. And also A1 is one. The initial conditions therefore are A0 is one, A1 is one. Okay, if A0 is one, we're gonna put it here in this one. So which means one is A plus B, what's that? 
If A1 is 1, then this is A... Okay, sorry. This one is A0. So the it means N is 0. N is 0 because N is at the bottom. So you must put 0 here. A1 is 1, so it means N is 1 because the subscript is N. So this is 1 and then plus B to the power 1. Okay, this is therefore A plus B. Minus A to B. Solving for A and B gives Um, gives that uh, so these are like simultaneous equations um, can use matrices to do this ones we need to solve for the numerical values of A and B out of this okay so you can have this one um, yeah you can multiply this one by 8 Getting 8a, 8b equals 8. 8a minus 8b. Which is 16a equals 9. Which is 9 over 16. Now b... We have this, which is seven out of sixteen. Okay, let's see if these values of A and B are the correct ones. Oh, I made a mistake. Okay, this is a mistake here. Because this is minus 5, but accidentally there is an 8 here that is not supposed to be there. This 8 is not supposed to be there. I'm going to remove all this. Um, right. Remove all these. So, um, so this one is five B. This one is five B. Right. So, I um, need to correct this. Mm, okay, so here you can multiply this one by 5. Because I wanted to eliminate the B by, I wanted to use the method of elimination um, of the linear equations. Right, so obviously this one here, you can just multiply by 5, giving 5A plus 5B, multiply the 1 by 5. Here, this one is 8A minus 5B equals 1. Okay, you can add these two equations. If you add them up, what you get? You get uh, 5a and that which is 13a. Which is equal to 6, which means a is 6 out of 13. What is b? Um, right, using so using maybe the first equation a plus b equals one with a equals six out of thirteen. 
what we get, you substitute, you get here, you get the value of B. So you plug, you put this one in there. So this one is six out of 13 plus B equals one. B is one minus six out of 13. And then this is, what is 13 minus six? Seven. <laughs> yes. Seven out of 13. Okay, just check that. But that's what you get. Um, right, so we're able to conclude, uh, therefore the solution is as follows. So this means we got that A is um, six out of 13 and B is seven out of 13. Therefore, the solution is a n. Okay, um, this is the the um. The general solution we, we wrote down. Right, from the general solution, this one, which is AA to the power that, B to the power that, which means A is 6 out of 13, A to the power that, plus seven out of 13 minus five to the power of that. Okay, so that's what we get. So therefore the solution is that one. All right, is that of 13 and seven out of 13 there. Okay, so we're done with that. So what was the question? We have to solve the recurrence relation, this one. And we have been able to solve the recurrence relation very, very successfully. And we demonstrated the method. So this one was easier quite because it's actually called a homogeneous recurrence relation because it has the A's and, and, and everywhere. There's an A and A and A everywhere. So it's easier because of that. Right, it's easier because of that. Now, there is another type of a recurrence relation, this one. See, this one is different because there's an A and A, but there is an N term. That is, so this one is actually um, said to be an inhomogeneous recurrence relation. How do you deal with the inhomogeneous case? So we analyze that. Um, with, with much care and caution. So how do we deal with this one? We analyze that and make sure that um, we are able to solve that. So it is the subject of the discussion at the moment so that we are able to make good sense of this. Right, and obviously I'm going to highlight uh, and indicate uh, with the greater precision, how we solve problems like this, uh, right in the exam, because um, this kind of a question is uh, is a question that you can expect to find either you have homogeneous or you have an inhomogeneous case. So let's look at the slightly complex case, which is the inhomogeneous case. But first things first, we note that this is. This is an inhomogeneous, inhomogeneous linear recurrence relation. The corresponding
the corresponding homogeneous. So this one, because it is inhomogeneous, because it has this n term. So we convert it, so we obtain the corresponding homogeneous recurrence relation. Homogeneous recurrence relation. What is the homogeneous that is corresponding? So we just remove that term. So we shall look at this one. We shall look at um, after eliminating that one, just dropping it. Okay, so normally this is a standard procedure in mathematics to deal with the inhomogeneous in equations. So we write this one, a n, and then it becomes um, 3, a n minus 1, with general solution. I'm very quick to do that. Okay, we can set the general solution straight away, but it's uh, we can do it step by step because we're still learning. Um, because we already know how to solve the homogeneous ones. Like, because now this one is already homogeneous. Right, corresponding homogeneous is that from which we can let, um, we can let a n, be alpha to the n, a n minus one is alpha to the n minus one. So that this is alpha that, the alpha that. Okay, so from this you can multiply by alpha, alpha to the n, which is alpha, Three alpha that which means it is alpha to the n plus one, which is three alpha to the power n. You can factorize alpha from this, which means alpha to the n is alpha minus three equals zero. This means alpha to the n is zero, or it means that uh, alpha is three. Right, so, but we are actually interested in these parts. Right, so we're interested in that part. You see, because we're interested in that part, um, um, thus, thus the general solution The general solution is a n a that we have Okay, the general solution is that one. We have Fn, which is 2n. Now we focus on this one because we dropped it, this 2n. So we have that um, thus a particular, so something called a particular solution. We looked at a general solution. So now we're looking at a particular a particular solution is a homogeneous is a homogeneous relation is okay um to the inhomogeneous relation Okay, because now we're getting to the inhomogeneous part. We the general solution came from the homogeneous part, but now we're getting to the inhomogeneous part. We are making mention 
of the fact that now we're focusing on the QN. So, to the inhomogeneous part. So, inhomogeneous, yeah. Okay, so at this point, uh, so we have V1, we have this. Okay, because this one is linear, it's to end, so you can write the particular solution as a linear equation. So if you look at this one here, it relates to a linear equation, y equals mx plus c. Linear from school, straight line. So this takes us from high school. So if you have linear straight line, we can write it like this, but it's the same as y equals mx plus c for the equation of a straight line in school. Um, but the, the university, we're just uh, writing it like that. So, yeah, it depends on n. Uh, this one depends on x. Okay, so y is a dependent variable. Um, x is the independent variable, that kind of thing. All right, so we have that one. Next, we substitute. We substitute. We substitute into the recurrence relation. We substitute into the recurrence relation of the B1 plus B1 and B0. Right, so if we substitute into the recurrence relation, um, let me just write it clearly here. All right, so we reason what is happening here with the particular solution case. So with the particular solution case, we are effectively saying the given recurrence relation is this one here. Okay, right, so if we come here and we say B1N plus B0 is three. And then we have already said um, A sub N star is B1N plus B0. Right, so it means now wherever there is a n, you're going to put this b1 and b0, which we have put here. Then, but here now is a n minus 1. So we shall put b1 n minus 1 b0. Right? And then here we shall put 2 uh, like that. So what do we put um, um, over there? Right, so here obviously you have the 2n. So in the place of the 2n, what do we put? Because in the place of the an, we have put that. In the place of an minus 1, we have put b n minus 1. So here you have only n. Right, so in the place of only n, so we do not use exactly this because this one works in the case of a n and the a n minus one. So it actually um, means that um, in that case here, we're going to use a different notation. We're going to use a different notation. Right, so we can use an minus one, 
right you can use a n minus one or you can just keep it as um as a n right um sorry i'm going, we're going to just do that now here this is there's a principle i want to apply uh very carefully um right is this a principle i want to apply yes my dear all right thanks okay just a minute All right, yeah, after my class, I want to go to my All right, I'm right back, I'm right back, I'm right back. Okay, um, I want us to finish this here. And I was uh, looking at this problem. Right, there's certain things I want to um, look at um, when we're looking at the recurrent relations uh, in view of the homogeneous and inhomogeneous type. But I want to make mention of the particular solution case and uh, now and discuss this quite uh, uh, lucidly right in particular because you have that case where you have the linear case we call that the b1 um, in b0 right so and i want um, us to look at these cases very carefully where you have exactly that part there right so when you have exactly that part um you have that b1 um, and b0 which is uh, the star and then it is equal to that and then you have um exactly that part there okay i'll be with you now there's something i want to um, write very carefully in this case because um, I want to make sure that we analyze this correctly. So this must be 2n here. Must be exactly 2n. Why? Because of the 2n just being carried forward there. Right. So um, with, the, with that said, um, right, because there was a five points of other material, realize that. So you have this. Now you expand this. And this is now a linear equation you can deal with. So you distribute uh, by opening uh, the brackets. So this is uh, 3, 1, and minus 1. Distribute the 3. So it becomes 3B0 uh, plus twice N. So this is that, B0, which equals 3B1N minus 3 b1 plus 3b0 plus twice n okay we get this um from that what do we achieve now what do we achieve out of this okay the very interesting cases where you can have lots of solutions right so this is just uh, comparing both sides of the equation so this is exactly b0 let's compare the, the that group like terms together the ends so there's an n here and there's an n there so you have 3b1 plus 2 n here plus 3b0 minus 3b1 so um if you compare comparing coefficients you can see that Okay, so comparing coefficients. Um, yep. <laughs> I just placed something. 
my forgive me just play something in the screen went okay so yeah i wanted to say comparing coefficients right so comparing coefficients okay i tempered with the writing <laughs> just one minute right so i'm sure that that i did not that is my pen still there okay is my pen back all right um it's a little bit of magic i didn't press something if i press something here Just one sec. There's some buttons here. All right. All right. I'm right back. Oh, yeah, I'm coming back. I know. I pressed something and then now this thing just jumped. Okay. It's technology sometimes that's a bit unfamiliar. Right. So we're saying comparing coefficients. Okay, just a sec. I don't know why this is just decided to, to do that. Just a sec. I'm wondering why this. Okay, I'll be right back, I'm sure. But it is just acting up. <laughs> it will write, but yeah, I'm wondering why it's not writing now. We'll start writing, but it's just that it has just been okay. Just decided to act up, but acting up, it will be okay. Sure, yeah. I wanted to say comparing um, coefficients. My apologies, please. Uh, we don't know why that was. There's some buttons sometimes you just press and suddenly this thing jumps. Okay, there's B1. So now you, I'm comparing the coefficient of N there with the coefficient of N. So that's a B1, which is 3B1 plus 2. Okay, that is a, an equation. But yeah, you can be able to solve this one. How to solve this one? You can move the uh, this one, which is minus 2. B1 equals 2 which means B1 equals minus one. And B0. Um, right, so you have, you move this one across, it becomes minus two B0 equals minus three B1. Um, right, um, if you divide this one, Okay, you can substitute the B1 into this. So that's minus two B0, minus three, what is B1? B1 is minus one, which is three. Minus three out of two. Okay, so you've got this one here, B0. And you also got B1. Right, so B0 and B1. Okay. Okay. B0. So if you put it here, it becomes minus. Okay, I'm testing if these solutions are really correct. So you can substitute them into the original just to make sure that um, the correct solutions because I'm just finding this and it was not found exactly like this in the material I'm using. So there's just some typo there. Okay, but now we get this and after getting these, what does it mean? Um, right, so we have this. We have this. Right, so 
Thus, what does it mean? This means, you remember that we got that A star equation? So which means the A sub N star is B1N plus B0, B sub zero, which means A N star equals, what is B1N, which is minus N minus three over two. Okay, so that gives us a linear, a linear equation. That gives us a linear equation. Right, after we got this linear equation, we continue. No, we continue. What is then the general solution? Right, so next step. So I'm going to make a little bit of space here. You don't expect this to be that lengthy. Um, thus, um, right, we'll remember the one that we got. It was this one here. So we take this general solution and then we add that linear one. So the general solution was a sub n, a uh, three that. So it was a sub n, which is uh, a here, then three to the power n. Then we have this other one here. So we add, we combine because it was um, plus the a star. So it, be, it becomes minus n minus three over two, like that. So now we need to just use the, Initial solution, the initial conditions to find the correct value. What is the initial condition? A1 is two, A1 is two. So you come here and you then say, but A1 is two, which means that you have A1 is two, which means it is A three to the power one minus one minus three over two. So, Um, so, so you have this one here, which is minus five over two, right? Um, so you have that. Okay. So if it's minus five over two, you bring it across, it becomes five over two plus two, which is three A. You multiply it through by two, which is five plus four equals six A which means nine is six A. And therefore the answer to this is that we have nine out of six equals A. And then this one is exactly three out of two. Okay, getting three out of two means therefore we can write the final answer in the little block here. What is the final answer? Okay, we just plug in the A there. So, which means that a sub n is uh, 3 over 2, 3 over 2 times 3 to the power n minus n minus 3 over 2. Okay, with that said, you can test this solution here. You can test this solution and see what you're getting. Okay, uh, I would have to test uh, if this is actually uh, it satisfies the original linear, uh, the, the initial condition. Uh, we know that A1 is two. So if you plug it there, that would be A1 is uh, three over two, three to the one minus one minus three over two. I'm expecting this result to become a two. To become a two, is it a two? Okay, you have nine over two minus uh, five over two. What is five minus nine minus five? It's four over two, which is equal to what? Which is equal to two. So it means A1 is two. So yeah, this must be the solution to the original problem. So we have just demonstrated how to solve an inhomogeneous linear recurrence relation. 
So you can always check your answer by checking if the A1 is the initial condition is satisfied. And we can see the initial condition is satisfied. I was just checking in that little block there. Right. And I think that we started up at what time? We started it just slightly after half past seven. Um, right. So um, we are doing well, quite. And I think that this is enough for today. I will spend a lot of time on graph theory tomorrow. Um, just to make sure that uh, because graph theory forms the first part of the of the exam. Um, so we shall spend a lot of time on it. I'll try to be early tomorrow. Um, I don't expect uh, any delays, you know. But the best time to have our discussion tomorrow is actually half half six. I know it's, it sounds a little bit late, but it's the best time for me to have the discussion because um, the, the, the day sometimes is a little bit hectic because now you see the exams are on and now somebody is having a problem here. Somebody wants to consult these short, 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 short things, uh, etc. So, um, right. So the best time that's a bit quiet um, is from half six to be safe because I don't want to stay time that is going to be problematic. But I'm going to be looking at graph theory. But a couple of other things I was planning to look at tenary sequences that good, the good and bad sequences. I plan to do that, but it's going to take us a bit of time to do this question because it's very long. It's seven marks, but the good and bad sequences we need to um, analyze. Like we looked at it, there was like a zero, um, like a one, two, something, like a zero, one, two, um, that should not was not supposed to be in the sequence or something like that. We're supposed to find those sequences. All right, the inclusion exclusion principle for n-digit decimal sequences. Um, in other cases of the these ones, the number of the sequences, so two A's where we use the, um, um, the generating functions. I plan that we look at a bit more, we spend time on generating functions because they, they can be a little bit tricky. Um, so those are the kinds of things I planned as well. And this one's a bit more on the graphs as well, um, because graphs are easy, but yeah, I think that we need to just go to some of the basics on graphs, some of the basics on graphs. So tomorrow we shall look at those. Um, but I said the best time, I think, if you can be able to pick up enough energy um, to make sure that by half six, the, um, the day is a little bit less hectic now because it's exam season, it's exam period. And then we can have the discussion that is uninterrupted. Um, right, so think of that. And then I'll try to pick up early and gather a lot of the things because the kinds of questions like the complement of the graph, we look at the complements, but now some of the basic things, the chromatic numbers, given any graph. Um, this one is some triangles. So one can be like, okay, I can you can easily find um can easily find a triangle, and therefore um, the chromatic number is at least three. But can you also be able to find um, um okay, this is just one of my students is just worried about the portfolio task is in education. So you yeah. All right, so we are by and large done uh, with the discussion. Right, yeah, can I get back to you, Copano? Just, uh, all right, give me like five minutes, okay? <laughs> all right. All right, yeah, just like five minutes, I'm having a class discussion. Thank you, Copano. <laughs> Those other students is having a portfolio submission tonight, and it's like, how is, is she gonna submit the portfolio in education? Um, is an assessment portfolio uh, for them to teach doing practicals in the schools, but I'm sure she did not uh, spend time on it and she should be submitting tonight. All right, that is the student story. All right, so yeah, I can meet you earlier tomorrow if it happens, but yeah, I don't want to be making mistakes and give you some earlier time that uh, might change because of 
the end of year exam fever you know there's this fever that people have and now somebody's stuck is he is, is having a question is he's, he's saying this one i don't know can somebody help me this one you know that kind of thing okay i think i'm gonna thank you for joining us today i'll see you again i'll see you again tomorrow okay. so yeah. half past six tomorrow yeah half past six in the evening it's safer for me because I don't want to lie to you. <laughs> because the day sometimes comes with surprises, you know. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, this... what what should I uh, what should I be doing when we're not having the lesson? Should I be watching the videos? Is the videos enough? Yes. Yeah. You should be watching the videos. Okay. What's the What's the point of watching the videos? You watch the videos, and uh, it's not a question of just watching the video from the beginning to the end. But it's a question of really watching the video and pausing the video, trying to make sense of the discussion we had on a solution. For example, here is this question. So you watch the video from the beginning of a question to the end. And then after you watched it, ideally there are two phases of learning because I'm a mathematician myself. Uh, right, with a master's degree. But I've learned, I've looked at how best to learn mathematics because I learn every day. I read papers and I, I publish uh, papers. But if I read anything and I read somebody's paper because they've written a research paper, for me to understand it, normally I must first read through it. That is the first phase of me learning the thing because I've, it's something I'm seeing for the first time. Then the next phase is to ask myself if I understand the things. Normally my understanding is tested by my ability to solve the thing. If it's a solution, I must be able to write the solution on my own. That will determine if I understand because if I'm able to write down the question and close the solution, can I be able to write the solution to this problem on my own? It comes with cramming, somebody to say, or memorizing the solution. Somehow you note the steps because that is the first phase of learning. You might not understand fully why some of the things are done here. And until, because these things are common, even in differential equations, these things are done. But I've just now they are playing in, in recurrence relations. So you need to watch the videos because if you watch the videos, the videos focus on exam questions. So it's not a question of understanding exactly the solution, but it's really saying how was it done? It was the question was this, and these were the steps that were were followed. With that, then I I believe that if the quiz if a question comes, then you'll Normally, the questions in this in this module are not going to be very different from the ones seen. Graph theory does not change substantially. It's a fact. So what does one do? Okay, how did we find the chromatic number of a graph, for example? So this graph, this is how the chromatic number is done. For example, in the graph question we looked at last time, there was um, a K4. What is K4? K4 is the complete graph on four vertices. K4, you put four dots, four vertices, and you, you connect with all possible lines, and, and then that becomes a possible ages, and that becomes um, um, a K4. Then you then say, this is how the chromatic number is determined. Let me watch and uh, just try to follow this question. Then you write down the question on paper, can you be in a position to at least remember how it was done? It's a question of just remembering. With the time, you'll get the reasons why most of the things are done that way. Um, I mean, these things can raise a lot of questions than answers. But at least if one is able to follow the answer by being able to reproduce the answer, first you cram, you like memorize. Memorize and see that you can be able to um, reproduce it. That is the first phase of learning. 
And then now, if you can follow the videos, because like the previous video, uh, the, the previous video and today's video, the previous video was a full exam paper, but it was just missing the first question discussed today. And so, um, with that said, you would then say the, that other video looked at the question from the beginning. But there's another video we did where there were like degree sequences. Um, when they were like, state whether the graph exists or not, there was like one, um, we call those degree sequences, there was like a one, one, three, three, two, two, five. And the question becomes, does this graph exist? Okay, does uh, this graph exist? And then what do you do? What is the first thing that you need to do? Because these are the kinds of questions. This is, this was my, amongst the first. But now, obviously, these these are degrees of vertices. This is called the degree sequence, for example. This this will be like the first questions you will see in the multiple choice. I can't imagine anything else. I've not seen the exam, but I can't imagine anything else that fits to be multiple choice than just giving a degree sequence and then saying. Um, it exists or it does not exist. So it's a multiple choice. So you can determine if, if this degree sequence is given, does the graph exist with, with this degree sequence or it does not exist? So you need to remember the first, uh, the first uh, theorem of graph theory. What does the first it say? It's the sum of the degrees, the sum of the degrees of a vertex V, where V belongs to the vertex set of a graph G, is actually twice... Uh, M, we call this so, which is twice the size, twice the number. So in other words, this must be an even number for the graph to exist. So you need to add these things. If ever you add these degrees and it, the, the sum is, is an odd number, like in this case, I just took this off the top of my head. I was not looking to any question paper. But if you say one plus one um, is two, and then you have uh, three, six, eight, ten, 17, okay, so this cannot, the graph cannot exist of this one, for example, because it is 17 and the first theorem of graph theory says the sum of the degrees of a graph must be an even number, two times a number. And therefore this one is 17 if you add all the sum of the degrees, so it cannot be even. Okay, so that kind of thing. So I'm just there for mentioning. So one looks at the discussion like that. One looks at the question. There was a degree sequence in amongst the one that we did before. I think it was a video before the the the, the, the last one that we did before this one. We, if you, that is not confusing enough, right? So that degree sequence question, how was it done? One graph existed and the other one did not exist. Um, so. This is the question. Normally, these are exam questions I'm looking at. I've taken them from past exam papers. So here's the question. It's very long, this one, the solution. And then you'll be like, okay, try to follow this solution. It's, go it's not going to be easy to understand this at first because it's not a lot. You might have questions on why this? What is the definition of this? Okay, because I've been doing this for years now. Um, for me, it's a bit natural. I just need to remember, okay, this is the definition, etc. into this, what happens here. Um, but for somebody who's seeing this for the first time, can be like, but actually, what is happening here? But now what is very important is to say, how was it solved in the sequence of steps? And can you try to remember that? The videos should help with the exam type questions and how they are solved. This module does not go beyond what is usual. There are multiple choice that are coming, but it's to, to be the first time that the multiple, choice, multiple choice questions will appear in the exam. But the multiple choice questions, why are they brought in? They're brought in because they realize that the students are struggling with this, with this uh, module. So multiple choice questions are brought in because they realize that students are struggling with the module. So when students struggle with the module, like linear algebra, 
Linear algebra, there was a time when the students were failing linear algebra like flies at, at, at the university. They started striking the protests and so on. They were discussing to the Department of Mathematics about the fact that students are failing linear algebra too. It was 2611. There was a time when that module was offered by one colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Ghosh. He, 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 he tightened it. He's, he's, he's actually of Indian origin. But he made it he made the, the, the exams uh, quite hard for the students, and the students started protesting, etc. When they protested, the discussion was, let linear algebra be simplified. So how was it simply they brought multiple choice, multiple choice exams? What are the students who would just choose A, B, C, or D, something like that? Why multiple choice? Because the belief is that when multiple choice questions are there, at least... Uh, you can see the answers and you, you can just try to make sense of the answers that are there than just being given a full paper that is not having multiple choice. So also this one, graph theory has not been having multiple choice, at least as far as I started seeing the exams. I've never seen multiple choice exam or multiple choice questions in the exam, but now they have brought them and this is the perfect opportunity to pass this exam. Because the belief is that multiple choice are easier. It's some belief because the answers are already there you need to choose. That having to prove things and generate proofs that are difficult and require a lot of reasoning to construct and higher order reasoning according, according to Bloom's taxonomy of educational objectives. We believe that um, the level of constructing knowledge is the most advanced. And we believe that people need to learn first what exists um, they need to recall things than asking a student to build knowledge, to construct a statement, to construct a sentence. First, the student must learn separate words. After they've learned separate words, then you can say to the student, construct a sentence. But to construct anything um, in education, we believe is the highest level of, um, um, of, of reasoning. And, and, and in, in assessment and, and exams, we believe that is the highest level of, of testing. And only the most capable student to understand can construct something new, like construct a sentence. The first questions that are easier, we say um, identify, because a person who has learned must just identify. So those are like basic or recall, something like that. Okay, but we'll discuss this in detail. For instance, this announcement, I will just uh, run through this. This announcement serves uh, to make you aware of some issues with regards to the MAT 3707 um, exam um, on October 5, 2023. Um, 10.45, it's, it's late morning, so it's perfect, this one. Um, one can wake up and, and have a cup of coffee, uh, etc. cetera, in 10, 10.45, just mid-morning, just at about 11 one starts. Right. The paper consists contains 45 questions, um, questions 1 to 30 on graph theory and uh, questions um, 32 to 45 on combinatorics. OK, so you can see that combinatoric graph theory is going to be having the most questions. 1 to 30. And then this one is going to be having um, fewer questions uh, there, 32 to, um, to 45. So just about uh, 13 questions on combinatorics. Right, questions of uh, 1 to 40 are MCQ type. Okay, um, so you shall have to just indicate your choice. So this is a perfect opportunity to pass because it's MCQ, so just you need to indicate your choice. Um, 41 to 45 require detailed answers. So it means that you just actually have four questions, essentially. Right. Oh, 41 inclusively, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, just about five uh, questions there that require detailed answers. Right, so in other words, uh, you have about five questions that require um, answers where you need to write long, uh, long answers. Now, this looks like a perfect opportunity to pass, but also an attempt to simplify this course because many students are sort of struggling with this course. Um, right, so um, that is why they just brought in the multiple choice. Uh, the first page of your answer sheet must be it must be the table as indicated in the question paper. 
okay? Containing your choice, uh, your choices uh, for questions one to four. Just look at this. They do not set the marks. I'm not seeing the marks yet in terms of the weightings of this. But uh, looking at these um, questions one to 40, um, MCQ is a perfect chance to just get the MCQ right. If they really have the correct weighting, um, you can, if they have the right weight, then you can always do those and almost pass. You're expected to provide reasons for your answers in the later pages of your answer sheet. Note your reasons in the later pages shall be taken into account for part marking if your choices are incorrect. Okay, that's interesting. Right, you're expected to provide reasons for your answers in the later pages for your um of your answer sheet. Note, your reasons in the later pages shall be taken into account for part marking if your choices are incorrect. Okay, this is fair. This is fair because one can make a wrong choice, but they have some correct reasoning uh, as part of the process and, and, and just that the choice became incorrect. All right, please find a list of frequently asked questions for the IRIS proctoring. Um, you're required to use the IRIS invigilation system for your upcoming exam. So you need to obviously practice this, please. You need to get, get your IRIS running properly. There are times when IRIS gets stuck, you need to restart it. So you need to make sure that it's you have the right installation of it and it's able to run properly and you it's properly embedded on your on your Google Chrome or on your thing on your um, Mozilla Firefox right you have added uh, you have been added to an Iris practice all right yeah you have been added to an Iris practice 2023 site or on the exam site platform so you can do the Iris practice Right, so uh, on this site, you'll find instructions on how to install and use Iris. Okay, so it's very important. There are also practice tests to check if Iris is working correctly. So it must be able to work correctly. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, please go to the site well before your exam, the examinations to make sure your Iris um, will work correctly during your exam. Note that you'll only receive your examination results if Iris is running without the examination seating and if full recordings are uploaded. Okay, this is very important. So you need to make sure that at least you have an IRIS recording um, submitted. You can have a look at the IRIS just to make sure that it runs properly. Um, um, tomorrow, we can share screens, right? Uh, something like that. Because if the IRIS recording is not sent to UNISA, then the results will not be released, even if it's a distinction, you know, because there will not be any iris recording. So it's very important they're saying, um, note that you will only receive your examination results if iris was running throughout the examination setting and if full recordings are uploaded. You need the recordings to be uploaded. Okay, so you can always have the iris and iris look um, uh, something like that, but yeah, um, we'll have this. We'll Hello. Yes, please. Uh, for point five, uh, yes. if I give the right the right multiple choice answer but the wrong reason, how will they mark that? Oh, that's a good question. So you only get four marks. You look at, yeah, because you see, uh, the the reasons themselves constitute part marking, so. Um, right, so the reasons will constitute part marking. In other words, if the choices are wrong, they will have to look at the the uh, uh, the, the reasons to sort of um, leverage on your contributions based on the reasons you stated. Um, but if your choice is correct and your reason is wrong, probably that's full marks um, because those part marks will um, will not quite apply because the part marks, uh, your reasons in the later pages shall be taken into account for part marking if your choices are incorrect. So if you have a wrong choice, if you have wrong choices, you have a wrong choice, then the lecturer says they have the the mercy, the grace to go to the later later pages and. Uh, try to see what you wrote there. And that only basically happens if, but if your choices are correct, then there'll be no need quite for the lecturer to be 
going to the reasons, you know, um, there. Okay, so that's just one thing. But yeah, um, very, very interesting. But yeah, um, I will think about this structure as well. But the truth is this structure is there to simplify the exam and to make it less threatening because it's one of those modules that um, is, 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 is quite scary to many students. Um, this is quite um, a little bit complex, but at university, we do, not we do not recognize these as complex. That is why at university, we recognize these as an elective uh, module for math learning. For there are modules you call core modules in mathematics, uh, which are algebra and analysis. Algebra and analysis, we call them core modules because if a person has learned mathematics, they must have learned algebra and analysis um, and something called topology, which, are which is analysis. Um, but these kinds of, uh, this is just graphs. We believe that if somebody has learned algebra, they can count. In analysis, they can deal with functions and the behavior, because analysis is just the behavior at infinity of structures, infinite sets, infinite sequences. That's what analysis is about. Even when you speak about the um, numerical analysis, the, all the forms of analysis, they focus on what happens at infinity. When you speak about infinite series, power series and things, so all, all those are just components of, 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 of mathematical analysis. Okay. Um, right, so yeah, we shall spend some time tomorrow. But once again, if you just uh, play around with the videos, just look at the solution. This question, how was it solved? Try to make sense of it. Try to memorize it. Because the way I was looking at the solutions to the questions here, it's exactly how the memos are. <laughs> I'm not really fond of changing much, except that if there's a, a typo in the memo, and that is when I try to modify if, if but otherwise I'm following exactly the exam guidelines here and how the memos are written. So meaning that this is actually the solution to the question. This is how the memo was by and large. Um, and therefore, if one understands this discussion, one understands the memo and they can be able to write it like this in the exam, surely they cannot fail. This is the memo itself. That is my point. Okay. We shall discuss then tomorrow at half six um, more of graph theory. But what should you know about graph theory? Because it's multiple choice, you surely can expect some definitions, a matter of fact, but this is not very elaborate. But because it's multiple choice, multiple choice comes with definitions, but definitions have not been part of this course for the longest time. Um, this course has not been focusing on when are two graphs are two graphs isomorphic? They did, they did not ask such questions, but they did not ask the people to state any theorem. But they asked the students to apply. They gave you graphs and said, are they isomorphic or not? And you had to determine if they're isomorphic or not. The, no one asked the students in this module ever to define a chromatic number, but they said, find the chromatic number of a given graph. You see, those are the kinds of things. Um, that that is sort of the structure. It has been the structure of the module, and I, and I and I and I believe that, and I can most certainly say, looking at the way the assignments have been for this module throughout the the year, the assignments have been repetitive of old assignments. With my experiences in in assessment, I can say already that if the same lecturer was set the assignments that were repetitive of old things, old assignment questions, I just maybe modified a little bit, changed the two to a three, then surely you can predict the exam that the exam is not gonna be new entirely. It's just gonna be repetitive as well because the assignments were not new questions. The assignments were old questions. So the exam is not gonna be new, most definitely. That is my prediction. And 
um, with my experience as in in which my with my experience in assessment, I can safely say that I'm expecting the exam questions not to be new. What does it mean? It means the kinds of questions we discussed here are the questions that are going to come like this amongst the long ones. Amongst the long ones. But some of the multiple choice might be long. Some of the multiple choice might not just be, you can just read the question and get the answer without working it out. That is why this guy is saying, your reasons in the last later pages shall be taken into account for part marking if your choices are, are incorrect. Because some of the, this graph theory comes with some steps and, 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 and reasons. And you might need, what about if, the question is how many arrangements of the letters? I believe it's not going to be the case because it can be worth about seven marks, that multiple choice question, because to get to the number of the arrangements, you'll have to go through all these and to go through all that. And now if this is multiple choice, it's unfair. It will surely be unfair because how does one make a question like this a multiple choice with so much reasoning and now you can make a mistake in the middle and then get a get the wrong answer. And then now if you get a wrong answer, you check amongst the choices, maybe the answer is not there. So since that's a long calculation, it will not be a good one to be a multiple choice. But we believe that the multiple choice will show sort of things that will not require a lot of reasoning like this and a lot of calculations. Anyway, it's just my take. But yeah, we'll discuss first graph theory tomorrow so that you can just uh, be aware of the kinds of things you need to learn for graph theory. But yeah, the truth is graph theory is not difficult, but Graph theory is like geometry in school. Geometry in school, the kids find it tricky in the beginning because they'll be like, if you look at circle geometry in school, um, it, this is just like circle geometry. You know, it's 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 it's, it's pictorial representations, and now sometimes uh, this is easier, but we believe that geometry is for visual learners. The learners who learn by visualizing things and they can easily identify equal angles in school um, when you're doing circle geometry and things like that. All right. Um, I think that, yeah, we'll talk more at 6.30 p.m. tomorrow. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to be looking at the many things that we can discuss at that time and how best we can prepare for the day after tomorrow okay yeah i must thank you for joining us i'm so sorry i uh, you know i took that just a bit too much um right i will see you tomorrow at 6 30 but i might just send something if i think about something if i see a question i might just send something on whatsapp uh, that relates to the things you need to learn whatever yeah I'm not saying maybe a question or something like that or a hint um, on WhatsApp. Yeah, but I'll see you ultimately at 6.30 p.m. But thanks a lot then and have a good evening. All right, goodbye.